from Stanford uh, to give us a talk about uh, sphere and this partition functions in Louisville and in matrix integrals. Thanks so much for agreeing to give the talk and please. Yeah, thanks Nima. Thanks uh, everyone for the invitation. And I'm very happy to tell you about this uh, recent paper that we wrote with Douglas Stanford and Cynthia Yan, who's a graduate student at Stanford. And related work actually completely independently also appeared by these authors, uh, especially Dio Aninos and Beatrix Muhlman. So uh, the big picture of, uh, of this talk is that usually if you open Green Schwartz Witten in the first paragraph, the, you talk about scattering amplitudes. And scattering amplitudes, let's say the easiest one is a two to two tachyon. So two tachyons to two tachyons for a four point scattering amplitude. And we compute this, this is the Venet or the closed string version of the Veneziano amplitude and so on and so forth. And there's a beautiful string perturbation theory. Uh, there's a genus expansion. You can have more insertions. The topic of this talk is a sphere diagram, but without any vertex insertions. So no vertex operators are to be inserted. So you can ask, this is a, kind of a free energy computation or something that just tell, telling you about uh, the path integral just evaluated e to the minus the string action integrated over the string configurations. But this is the topic. You can ask the similar thing about the disk. Again, in the disk, the Veneziano amplitude we insert, usually we start by inserting four vertex operators on the boundary of the disk, but we will be asking about just the empty disk with no vertex operator insertions. So what do these diagrams mean in string theory? Um, the distinguishing character of these diagrams is that their Euler character um, is positive instead of negative. So most Riemann surfaces of high genus or with a sufficiently large number of insertions have negative Euler character. These guys have positive Euler character. Okay, so there is a general lore that the sphere partition function without operator insertions uh, is a fundamental quantity, but it's also very confusing. The expectation is that it should give minus the classical value of the on-shell action of the string background. So strings propagate in some background, it could be flat space, it could be ADS3 times S3 times T4, or any other background that satisfies the uh, consistency conditions of string propagation. So this is interesting because if you ask, for example, in ADS3 times S3, and you put the ADS3 on a cylinder, the boundary is a cylinder, then there is a quantity, which is the ground state energy of a CFT2, which lives on the boundary of ADS3. And this is the Casimir energy. It's like negative C over 12 or something like that. And if we remember our lessons from brown Hino the central charge of the boundary theory scales as one over G Newton in the bulk. So this is something like LADS over G Newton. And I am basically emphasizing the presence of this one over G Newton in the denominator, which is what it means for this term to be classical. Like it's coming from the gravity side, it's coming from an on-shell action of the ADS3 saddle. So question is, can the string world sheet reproduce this computation? And I don't think it's uh, clear cut known whether it can do that as of today. I mean, of course we match correlation functions of a CFT. If you have a four point correlation function of a CFT, we can match that. But these more fundamental kind of sort of more mundane quantities like the free energy or the, this kind of Casimir energy are not known how to match from the string world sheet to the boundary theory. So this is the motivation. Um, and why did I say that it's a confusing quantity is that um, the Riemann surfaces with positive Euler character like the sphere, they have the so-called conformal killing group. So there's a PSL2C group of transformations that is not fixed when we fix the metric on the sphere to be in the conformal gauge. And in string theory, we are supposed to divide by volumes of these gauge groups and this PSL2C is gauged in string theory. So it seems like we are doing a path integral where we are dividing by the volume of this non-compact group. So there's some infinity in the denominator. 
Now, this is one should not rush to the conclusion that this means that the sphere diagram is zero. Because, for example, if the string is propagating in flat space or in ADS3, those spaces are non compact. So there's an infinity in the numerator of the path integral as well, which is just coming from the fact that the string can be anywhere in this non compact uh, space time. So it's more, it's, it's like ill defined. It's like infinity over infinity. This is the kind of answer you get. But the numerator infinity is due to uh, non compactness of the target space. And the infinity in the denominator is from the infinite gate group volume. Now, the disk is slightly better behaved, where you can do some trick, like Liu and Polchinski in the early 1980s showed that PSL2R, which is the conformal killing group on the disk, actually has a finite regularized value. So there, there's some infinity. Right. Can I ask you a quick question yeah. regarding this point yeah, you yeah. mentioned? If you're in finite volume, if the target space has finite volume, yeah. is this still defined? Is it infinite or that is it zero? Is zero then this is really uh, something finite over infinity. And then the sphere diagram is indeed zero. I think there is no question about that. And then the, the physics of that computation is? Yeah, is the that? physics of that computation is that, for example, a, it's is the fact that we have an on-shell on solution, but like a slightly bigger space would also be typically be a solution. Right, so this is computing the variation uh, of the action with respect to one of the fields in the path integral. And so just by the equations of motion of the, of the string theory, you can show that this is zero. I see, thank you. Okay, and in the disk, we are even better off because if we do, for example, supersymmetric uh, string theory, a PSL2R gets enhanced to its super version, which is called this group OSP one slash two comma R. Don't worry about what that means. But the point is that that super group has a finite volume. So there are some bosonic directions, which give you some infinity in the volume, but then there are some fermionic integrals, which give you zero. So you get something like zero times infinity, and there's a natural way to make sense of this. So what is this good for? So for example, you can use this volume of OSP one slash two comma R to give a direct computation of the de brain tension uh, of super string theory in 10 dimensional flat space just from the path integral. So the de brain tension is related to just the empty disk diagram. Right? E to the disk is E to the brain tension. And so one can do this computation even though this is not the thing that I'm going to present today. So it's useful to think of these very rudimentary sort of objects in string theory. So, and if you open Polchinski's book, he derives the de Brin tension via some indirect method where you have to first compute the annulus and then the annulus has a moduli space, which is a line and you have to go to a boundary of this moduli space where the annulus is supposed to factorize into two disks. And that's how he computes the disk. But what I'm saying is you could have just started with the disk fix the gauge, do just the path integral, just grind the wheel and you would land on the exact same answer. Okay. So this is why the sphere in particular is very subtle. Okay, so this, this point, uh, first point I already said that the sphere diagram is zero up to effects having to do with the non-compactness of target space. And basically one should remember that um, let's say we have a black hole background, which is weakly curved. So it approximately solves the string equations of motion. Uh, the way GR people compute things like the free energy of the black hole is via this Gibbons Hawking procedure, where you put some cutoff boundary term near asymptotic infinity. And we put some counter terms and take a limit and that gives the answer. And the hard thing in string theory is that it's hard to do string theory on a space that has a hard radial cutoff. Like I'm not aware of uh, examples where uh, we have, let's say some, some cigar geometry that represents the R and T direction of a black hole. And we just put a hard cutoff in the R direction and still have a meaningful CFT, a world sheet CFT. So this is a technical challenge and I'm not sure um, this direction of attack 
is likely to succeed or not. We, I just don't have anything to say. I just want to put this as a question. Can one put a space-time radial cutoff in the world sheet possibility? But anyway, again, this is not what I'm going to talk about. So what I am going to talk about is a toy string theory. A toy string theory is this non-critical string. Um, for our purposes, it's just the world sheet uh, where there are two sets of, or three sets of fields. There is a minimal model, um, a two comma P minimal model. So it's not like some scalar fields on the world sheet, but abstractly we consider a minimal model uh, propagating on the string world sheet. There's a Liouville field, phi. It's, you can think of it as a scalar, but not quite. And there's of course the usual BC ghosts to fix the diffeomorphisms. Okay, so this is the world sheet theory. It's called non-critical string theory because this Liouville field uh, is not decoupled. And the nice thing about this is not only can we compute the sphere diagram unambiguously, we can also check it against the dual description. So these non-critical string theories with this particular matter content have a dual as a one matrix integral. So this is the dual theory, it's just a integral over Hermitian matrices in some particular limit called the double scaling limit. This is the old kind of um, duality the, in, which was explored in the mid eighties to early nineties. And this sphere computation was actually previously done by Zamologikov in the very early days of Liouville theory. But we will go further and be very precise about all the numerical constants. And we will match a precise number to the matrix integral. That's, that's really, I want to stress that we really wanted to get all the factors of two and minus sign and everything correct. And that's what we heard. Just one comment is that this parameter P can be tuned, it can be any odd integer. And we will take P to be large. The benefit of taking P to be large is that the Liouville uh, part of the field theory uh, becomes semi-classic. So its action becomes like E to the minus something large times a functional of phi. So that's the semi-classical limit where we can just do saddle points plus one loop determinants. Okay, and we want to do this kind of semi-classical analysis, even though in this particular case, one can do better just because conceptually uh, it's nicer to think in the semi-classical limit and how the path integral is behaving. It doesn't matter what I wrote here that what the exact in B, uh, sorry, I should say what B is, B is square root of two over P. So P large means B small. So Exact in P formulas can be found, but uh, they're unintuitive and don't shed much light on what's going on. Uh, but so that's why we want to go to this large P limit and evaluate the integrals uh, semi-classically, which means in a one loop approximation, a saddle point plus one loop. Okay, so here's the punchline. And if you want to take one thing away from this talk, it's this slide. The point is that the Liouville field phi has a whole family of saddle points. So when we consider the world sheet to be the shape of a sphere, the Liouville field not just has one saddle point, but actually has a continuous non-compact family of saddle points. Each of those saddle points breaks the PSL2C symmetry. So you know, in the numerator, we have this non-compact family of saddle points which are related by PSL2C transformations. And in the denominator, we have precisely that group sitting. So they cancel. There's a natural cancellation in this case between the gauge group volume and the saddle point manifold, which is also non-compact. Another way of saying that is that one has a very clear way of Fadev pop-off gauge fixing the SL2C symmetry. Is just another way of saying what I just said before, more physically. Um, anyway, um, so are there any questions about this first point on this slide? So, sorry, each saddle for fixed P breaks PSL to C to just it breaks it completely. Let, let me say so P is not going to be varied. So, we are going to do the computation for each P. 
uh, okay. P is a parameter of the symmetry. So I have not explained what the saddle point manifold is, but roughly there will be a three dimensional manifold of saddle points. These are the saddles of the action for um, Liouville plus the this. Uh, just for Liouville, the, just for Liouville. The uh, minimum model goes along for the ride. Okay. Yeah, so there are these three factors in the world sheet theory. They're only coupled by the constraints. And so there's a three-dimensional manifold of saddle points. We will call their coordinates B1, B2, B3. So it's just some 3D manifold, which is non-compact. And each point in the saddle point manifold breaks PSL2C down to SU2. So SL2C is the group of all complex matrices with determinant one, two by two, and SU2 is the unitary subgroup. So there are three left over. So this is a six parameter group, and this is a three parameter group. And these Bs are the directions that are broken. So that's why I use B. I, I guess I just got a little bit confused because you also use B for as this parameter square root two over P or something. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, these this those Bs are different. Um, okay. So that that was just a parameter square root two over P. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. These Bs are just coordinates on this manifold, and this B here just stands for broken. So essentially, what I'm saying is there are six coordinates on PSL2C. We can split them into three coordinates that are symmetric, which means these are the three coordinates on SU2. And then there are three other coordinates. Right, thank you. Okay. So, however, there are some more conventional subtleties like the existence of conformal anomaly, uh, blah, blah. You need to track the, um, uh, there's a term in the string action proportional to just the Euler character of the world sheet. So actually it's not just the sphere, you can compute it if you fix some conventions, but what gives you a pristine real number, just a number is this ratio, sphere over disk squared. Uh, the reason is that the sphere uh, goes like G string to the minus two, and the disk goes like G string to the minus one. So when we take this ratio sphere over disk squared, the G string cancels. And in this matrix duality, it's hard to track what G string precisely is. So we can't track what G string is, but we can track this ratio sphere over disk squared. So this is what we would compute. And that's why the disk also comes into the picture. And this quantity, this real number is what we will match to the matrix integral prediction. Is there some sort of physical interpretation you have in mind for sphere over disk, disk squared? No, one could have used any other thing in the denominator here, which scales like G string to the minus two. So it's just to cancel the G string. Yeah, it's just to cancel the G string. For example, one could have done a genus two. Uh, so genus two diagram would go like G string to the two, G string to the plus two. So one could have actually computed sphere times genus two. This would also be a number, but genus two things are sort of hard to compute, so. I see, you just wanna check some uh, cross-check calculations that are GS independent. Exactly, because there is no way to track G string through this duality. Like we know how it scales, but it's hard to track the precise numbers. I see, thanks. Yes, yeah, so this duality is not like ADS uh, CFT where G string in the bulk has a precise numerical relation to sort of the N of the boundary and things like that. <clears throat> I'll come to that later, but anyway. So, <clears throat> so let me just give you a flavor of what the matrix integral computation looks like. So you need to know what the sphere corresponds to, what the disk corresponds to, and we will get to it eventually, but here's the point. The point is that for this two comma P model, two comma P plus Liouville plus the BC ghost, you need to find a matrix potential. You need to find it by hand such that the density of states looks like this. So there is an E to the S naught because that's like one over G string. That's the disk 
it's like e to the chi s naught term, chi is one for the disk. And there is a cinch of p over two r cosh one plus eight pi squared e over p squared. And um, if you tune your matrix potential such that this is the density of states, then the sphere partition function, as I will show you, contains some boring infinite pieces. And the interesting term is this one. So you see this here is e to the two s naught. So this is the sphere. Roughly speaking, the density of states is the disk, not quite, I will get to it. But you see that the e to the s naught dependence will cancel when you take sphere over disk squared. So this is a very simple answer, just some number two to the 10 pi to the sixth. And this is how it scales with P. Well, not scales, it's the exact formula, not at large P, this is for each P. So I, I said before in Liouville, we will only produce a P cube term here. So can you say where, where this density of states came from? Uh, yeah, so there's a big history of this where people were confused as to um, what this density of states should be. And uh, it was fleshed out that if you want, so the matrix integral has an arbitrary potential. We can pick the potential to be whatever we want. But if we want that matrix integral to be dual to the Liouville theory that I described, you have to pick this density of states. So you can- Right, but I mean, which what, what about the Liouville theory fix? is this i think you, for each, yeah. each value of the potential will correspond to something in the levial theory right yeah 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 good so right so if you pick some potential it will be a levial field but its action will not just be the one you might be used to so if you want to study this path integral with this you know kinetic term background scalar term and the cosmological constant term this particular action corresponds to that density of states. So I see. What, yeah, okay. what would it mean? Like if we added some other potential and changed this density of states, it would be like deforming this action. Right, thank you so much. That's right, thanks. So this is also goes by the name of the conformal background. And one thing I want to highlight is that if you take the P goes to infinity limit, of this formula, you see that the R cosh gets dominated by this uh, yeah, P is, so this is, this is small. So it's R cosh of one plus something small. So that becomes like square root of this number. So it's like square root of E over P. The P cancels here. And then rho of E is like cinch E to the S naught, cinch of square root of E. Uh, this is the density of states of JT gravity. So JT gravity is a particular limit of this one parameter family of theories that we're studying. So this is, this is JT. Okay, uh, any questions about that before we dive into the details? Uh, sorry, so the density of states you wrote down, that's for any P. Yeah, here P is general. There's no large P assumption here. Yeah, this is and if P. you take large P, then you go to this square cinch of square root of. Right, I see. Okay. Uh, the R cosh simplifies in the in that limit. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. So now let's get into it. Um, get into the Liouville computations. Um, there are three basic components to the computation. So. One, we have to identify the relevant saddle points because we are working in the semi-classical approximation and the associated steepest descent contours. We have to compute the one loop determinants and we have to divide by the volume of the gauge. So all these three steps we have to do. And they are pretty similar for the sphere and the disc. And I think I will just be able to get through the sphere. And for the disc, you can uh, read the paper. Okay. Uh, this point I have already made is that uh, there are non-compact, there is a non-compact manifold of zero modes, which gives an infinity in the path integral in the numerator. 
And the origin of these zero modes is that the saddle point configurations break the PSLTC spontaneously. So basically we, these B1, B2, B3, these three coordinates that I was showing you can be thought of as Goldstone modes, uh, non-compact Goldstone modes. And there is a similar story for the disk. For the disk, we could use the Liu-Polchinsky argument, but we can also do uh, what is the conformal symmetry, how much of it is broken, how much of it is preserved. So the point is for the sphere, we have this full symmetry group and SU2 is preserved. So this is the Goldstone manifold or the saddle point manifold. This is non-compact. And for people who know, this is also just like the three-dimensional hyperbolic space. So it's definitely non-compact and has infinite volume. And for the disk, we have something similar. It's PSL2R. This is the full symmetry group and each saddle point uh, for the disk saddle point of the five fields for the disk topology preserves a U1. And so this is some other space. Actually, this is two-dimensional hyperbolic space. But anyway, so this is also a Goldstone manifold for, for the disk. Sorry, is there some sort of a, can, can you say a few words about this uh, U1 or SU2 that the saddle respects, like preserve? Yeah. We will come to that. I will describe that very explicitly. Okay, thanks. Basically, one, you can just to give a quick answer, SU2 is basically SO3 at the Lie group level. And that actually, this should be PSU2. So it's exactly SO3. And that's just the isometry groups of the sphere. Right? The S2 has a, the right. metric has a symmetry, not just a conformal. Right, right, right. There are, there are three killing vectors, not just conformal killing vectors. And for the disk, we have the rotations about the center of the disk. I see. Okay. Yeah, so nice. these are sort of geometrically what these uh, uh, represent, the symmetries of the saddle point represent. Okay, so this is what we have to compute. Uh, the sphere path integral divided by PSL2C and uh, PSL disk divided by PSL2R. Okay, and as I have already said, there are all these subtleties. So we actually compute sphere over disk squared. And moreover, it's actually useful to think of the disk, not as a flat disk, but as the Northern hemisphere of the sphere. So think of this as a disk topology, but it's useful to do this to avoid uh, having to include conformal anomaly terms to compare this ratio. So when we make the disk in the shape of a hemisphere, the metric, the local metric on the sphere and the hemisphere is the same. So it, 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 it simplifies the problem. So whenever I say disk, think of hemisphere ending at theta equals pi over two at the equator. Whereas for the sphere, we will have the full sphere from theta equal to zero to theta equals pi. Okay. Okay, anyway, and I should say uh, about this point here that I have written these volumes of PSL2C and PSL2R. And on any Lie group, there exists a Haar measure with which we can compute at least the volume density, but the Haar measure is only defined up to an overall constant. That's not good enough for us because we want precise numbers. So, in string theory, where these volumes come from are actually zero modes of the C ghost. So the zero modes of the C ghost corresponds to conformal killing vectors. And in doing path integrals, we always pick a metric on field space. So the C field is just a field on the world sheet. There's a metric on the space of configurations of the C field. And it's that metric which gives rise to the volume measures on both PSL2C and PSL2R. Because the, uh, the metric on the field space is ultra local. So it doesn't care about the global topology of your space time. So that is the principle that relates the two volumes that we are going to have in this ratio here. Does that, does that point make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. All right, so now we get down to it. Uh, here's what the Liouville field means. 
uh, Liouville theory is a theory of two dimensional surfaces where the metric and the shape and the topology of the surfaces is fluctuating. We want to integrate over all of them. So we write the metric as a e to the two sigma and some background metric ds hat square. And the ds hat square, as I have said, we'll pick to be the sphere or the hemisphere. This is what also simplifies life for the hemisphere because the equator is a geodesic. So it has extrinsic curvature zero. So this is the background metric and sigma is a field. You can basically think of sigma as a scalar field on the sphere, but it does not transform like a scalar. To figure out the transformation law of sigma under diffeomorphisms, you have to use this equation. So the ds squared will transform like it does, and then that will impose a transformation on sigma. And uh, here is the action. So again, B was square root of two over P. You have to think of P as large, so B is small. Here is the central charge of Liouville theory. One plus six, one over B plus B squared. So you see that when B is small, the one over B is large. So the central charge of Liouville is large. The BC central charge is negative 26. So that means that the matter central charge the central charge of the two comma P is going to minus infinity. So this is the limit we are in. Here's the action. So partial Sigma squared, kinetic term, R hat Sigma coupling to the background curvature, mu E to the two Sigma is the so-called cosmological constant term. And note that mu has dimensions of length squared. Um, there's the Gibbons Hawking term. And if you have a boundary, we put a boundary cosmological constant. So there's there, there are two dimensionful parameters here, mu and mu b. And of course, b is a parameter. So we have these three parameters. Mu b enters only when you have a space with a boundary. And there are some, some other terms. Uh, note that uh, the, there's a one over b square sitting up front. So this is what I was saying that you think of B square as the parameter controlling the semi-classical limit. It's a large action when B is small. Note that the terms in 1.4 do not have the one over B square enhancement, but they are like H bar to the zero. So since we are going to be working at one loop order, which is H bar to the zero, we need to keep these terms, but we don't need to keep order B square terms in the action if there were any. So we are working to order one over B square and order B to the zero. Okay, so is this uh, clear, the setup? There's a scalar field. I haven't written the BC ghost action and the, and the two comma P minimal model, but B mu and mu B are the three parameters which our answers will be functions of these three things. Okay, uh, let me pause here just to get a drink of water and give people some time to maybe ask some questions. Okay, <clears throat> no takers for questions. Uh, uh, let's go. Maybe I can ask a question, but before, you know, I remember uh, in the Polchinski book, it says that you have to solve the zero mode by, by inserting the ghost operator, and there is some ambiguity of where do you insert it. So here you get, because if not, you get zero because of the ghost zero mode. Right, exactly. So, but what do you do then? Right, so that, good, good. So that is why in the very beginning of the talk, I started, you know, with this example, like usual in in uh, string theory, we start with the three point function or we, people usually start with the four point function, but the three point function is well defined. So the vertex operators for these four are actually a little bit different because three of these operators are fixed. So this operator would have a vertex operator CC bar times vertex operators. CC bar times a vertex operator, CC bar times a vertex operator. And this fourth one will be the integrated one. So this is a special one. So essentially when you have three or more vertex operators, 
it, the PSL2 symmetry allows you to fix three of them. Okay, so that's the context. Now, what happens when you have two or fewer? If you have two, if you have one, or you have zero. What you said, zero, that's the naive answer. That's what I was trying to say here, that um, if the PSL2C symmetry is left unfixed, if, for example, you can't fix it, at least with vertex operators, if you don't have a three, three or more, because you need three, then the zero would be like this. Zero. This would be the naive argument that the answers are zero. But that's too quick, as I tried to show you here. Okay, okay. Like, well, I, said, I looked at some phenomena similar when you compute the circular Wilson loop in ADS-CFT, you have a, this partition function, and I think it was never fixed. So maybe, so if you have a, a circular Wilson loop, it's a worksheet, which is a disk ending at the boundary, and you need to compute the partition function. And it, yeah. But I don't think it was ever solved, that issue. But maybe, yeah, I know I just some comment then. Okay, thank uh, okay. you. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the problem, but I, as I said, like for the disk, uh, things are less complicated because of this Liu Polchinski procedure. Yeah, okay. So one could actually just set the volume of PSL to R to be something like negative pi squared over two. It depends a little bit on your conventions, but, but for the disk, one could just use this. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so on to, on to the computation. Uh, let me rewrite the action here. It was d sigma squared plus r hat sigma plus uh, four pi mu e to the two sigma. r hat is equal to two because we are on the sphere. And let's just look for constant solutions. So the equation of motion would be something like d square sigma plus two plus four pi mu times two times e to the two sigma equal to zero. We are looking for constant solutions. So this term goes away, the two cancels, and we have one plus four pi mu e to the two sigma equals zero. Now, this is what I wrote here. This looks funny because you might think e to the two sigma is a positive number. So this has no chance of being equal to zero. But we have to be liberal path integrals our integrals, we can think of a complexified field space and we can think of the path integral as some contour integral in that complex plane. So we think of sigma generally as a complex variable. And once sigma is complex, there's actually an infinite number of saddle points. And this n is simply because e to the two pi i n is equal to one. So, so this is what we get. So there are saddle points which have some real part and also have some imaginary part. Okay, so there's some infinite number of saddle points. Uh, note that e to the two sigma being negative one over four pi mu and mu is positive for sure, mu is positive and real. This means that the ds squared e to the two sigma ds hat square has signature minus minus. So, that's also fine. We are just working with the analytic integrands and having a complex uh, variables so that we allow the metric functions to go negative. And this is what it physically means because the classical view will equation, um, this thing here, it says that the curvature of the Ricci curvature of ds squared is negative, constant negative. So this is why classical Liouville theory is used in the uniformization of Riemann surfaces. But okay, you might say a sphere has a positive curvature. It doesn't have negative curvature. But a sphere with a minus minus metric has negative curvature formally, r equals negative two. So this is the physical meaning of, of this um, shifts by odd multiples of i pi. And uh, this was also discussed in uh, recent discussions of JT gravity by uh, Turiachi, Maldasena, and Jen Binyang. Okay, so this is just what I said. So the classical equation for Liouville field imposes everywhere constant negative curvature 
and something funny has to happen if your ds hat square had curvature two and you want this full metric to have curvature negative two okay so this by all means it's allowed and there's no i don't think there's much doubt that these saddle points contribute to the path of the but not all of them contribute as we will see so what's the next step you have some action you plug it into the action you find the on shell action okay you do that i wrote the action before you can just plug it in note that the action has these one over b squares in the exponential so that's what happens in semi classical path integrals e to the 1 over h bar e to the 1 over h bar but there is this phase factor also coming from this imaginary part of the sigma okay now on the next slide i will justify to you that one should be summing over roughly half of these saddle points n equal to 0 1 2 3 and so on and just first let's just see the result the one loop determinant for all these ends is the same so we can multiply it at the end so so there is some one loop factor which is the same for all n but let's see what the sum over e to the minus i classical gives sum is a sum over n and it's a geometric series right it's e to the something n so this is a geometric series whose sum we can do and it pops out this one over sine pi b squared factor uh, it's a geometric series with a purely imaginary ratio but those are also analytically well defined like the geometric series analytically continued only has a pole at the when the ratio equals one but it's well defined for all other complex values another way of thinking about it is that you can think of b parameter also as being slightly complex and then the ratio will have magnitude less than one so anyway there is some geometric series and you get this funny sine pi over b squared factor and if you have looked at formulas in Liouville theory this one over sine pi b squared is ubiquitous it's like everywhere in these formulas so in the semi classical computation it's coming because it's it's coming from a sum over geometric series okay all right, so now to motivate why we only sum over half of these saddles, Sorry, let's think of a toy. Yeah. Question. Yeah. But this is all still a derivative of one loop, right? So you're yeah. just doing the one loop calculation for all the saddles and summing them. Yeah. The statement you made about Liouville, which is the sine pi over b squared appearing there, was yeah. that also a, a one loop statement or is that just like. A... No, that's an exact statement. So in the DOZZ formulas, for example, you have i'm just making a that that last statement was meant to be vague it was meant to say that there are some exact formulas that have these one over sine pi over b squared funny factors i, I guess i was asking that if you if you were to push the calculation to the higher higher orders yeah. then would you find similar things that would resum to factors of one over sine pi over beta oh, yeah squared? i yeah i think that the loop expansion about all of these saddles is the same. So the two loop answers would just get added here. Like outside this sum. I see. Yeah, I'm just saying that the loop expansion is sort of independent of n. The, the only piece that depends on n is the classical action. I see, I see, thanks. At least that's my guess, I mean, we haven't checked. I think these papers by Beatrix and Dio maybe have checked that to two loops. Okay, so let's think of this integral. Um, uh, so sigma now just think of it as one variable, just some complex variable, and this integral is some contour integral in the sigma plane. Um, you might so in our application, this this will be the constant mode of the Liouville field. So the part of sigma that's independent of where you are on the sphere. And in our application, A will be negative. A will have this value. Okay, so let's look at E to the A sigma minus E to the two sigma. So on the large positive real axis, as sigma goes to plus infinity, we have E to the minus 
e to the two sigma. This is very well convergent. We don't need to mess with anything. This is good. The A even drops out. However, on the negative real axis, when sigma is going to minus infinity, the e to the two sigma dies away and we are left with e to the a sigma. And if sigma a was positive, you would have e to the negative huge number and that would be convergent. But unfortunately, a is negative. So when a is negative, the sigma contour along the negative real axis is blowing up. So this, this integral is blowing up. So we have to define this integral by some analytic continuation. We have to specify a different contour for sigma. This contour cannot just be along the real axis when A is negative. And the contour that works, and there is some um, sort of playing around and some getting your hands dirty kind of thing that comes in is this contour. So the black contour is the defining contour here. So, uh, when sigma is large and positive, we just keep it along the real axis, but then we kind of bend it up in the complex plane such that the integrand is convergent. And actually, then you can clearly see. So I have marked with thick dots here, we mark the locations of the saddles and the dotted lines represent the steepest descent contours from the saddles. So you can take the defining contour and kind of wrap it like this, right? It can be deformed to this thing. So that's why only half of the saddles kind of matter. Uh, is that clear? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, one thing I want to say is that uh, this integral e to the a sigma minus e to the two sigma is actually a gamma function integral. If you put e to the sigma equal to t, this would be dt over t, t to the a, e to the minus two t. So this is a gamma function integral. And so what I've been telling you, like, you know, the gamma function asymptotics are well known, like when a goes to infinity or a goes to minus infinity, we know how the gamma function behaves. The point is, you know it actually when gamma function goes to the argument of the gamma function goes to plus infinity. That's the Sterling approximation. But when the argument of the gamma function goes to minus infinity, the gamma function has all these poles at the negative integers. So the asymptotics of the gamma function for negative real values of its argument is actually complicated. And one way to do it is to use the reflection formula, gamma one minus t, t equals pi over sine pi t. And if you want this argument to be large and negative, this is large and positive. So gamma of one minus t, is pi over sine pi t. And then you can use the Sterling here for gamma of t when t is large and positive. So you see again, there is the sine of pi t that comes up. So what I have shown you is basically a way that you could derive the asymptotics of the gamma function at large negative argument if you didn't know about the reflection relation of the gamma function. There is still some sum of saddle points, there is still some. Um, uh, so yeah, anyway. By the way, much of this was explained uh, in a paper by Harlow, Malls, and Witten uh, from early to 2010, 2013 or something. Okay, so I don't think I'm going to go over uh, the disk computation is pretty similar. There are some saddle points. You have to pick the right number of saddle points. There's some one loop determinant. The only thing I want to show you is that the solutions are now not just constants. The, the saddle point would be a sigma of theta. And so there's an equation of motion, but there's also a boundary condition. And I have written the solution here in terms of this number alpha. And alpha is determined in terms of mu b. So it's just some parameter in the solution. And you see, again, there are these ends here. So there's also some infinite family of solutions. Again, because only e to the two sigma kind of enters the game. So we will actually, for the disk, take a further limit. Mu b goes to minus infinity, which means alpha goes to zero plus. It's not so relevant, but this is an easy limit in which you can compute answers. 
And I wanted to emphasize that mu b is a parameter of the theory. So the parameters were b, mu, and mu b. And we are studying this when mu b goes to minus infinity. Well, again, there is some on shell action. Now it depends on this alpha, which is basically if you think of it as alpha as being mu b. And again, there is some large action, there's some n dependence, and blah, blah. Anyway, you can compute the on shell action, it's here. All right, so now let's come to the next part, the one loop determinants. So we have computed with saddles contribute, what are the on shell actions? And now it's time for the one loop determinants. It's, it's the same, it's a very familiar trick, trick. We expand the field, classical field plus a fluctuation, define a metric on field space, and um, that's it. Like, so this, this parentheses d chi d chi is an inner product F and G are two fields on the world sheet. This is the inner product. So this is the metric. This capital C sort of enters into the path integral measure. So when you integrate over fields, you're integrating over their modes and the C sort of enters. So uh, one trick invented by humanity is to expand the action to quadratic order. So when you expand the action in chi to quadratic order, you find a kinetic term and you find this negative mass squared term, minus two, a very precise particular value of the mass, which is important. It's very easy to see what the eigenvalues are. Eigenvalues of d squared chi would just be LL plus one and you get minus two. Each of them has the familiar degeneracy to L plus one. Um, we of course have to deal separately with the L equal to zero eigenfunction and the L equals one eigenfunction. For L equal to zero, the eigenvalue is negative. For L equals one, the eigenvalue is zero. So the L equal to zero guy actually we've already discussed. L equals zero means a shift in chi, which is independent of the uh, coordinates on the sphere. So that is captured by this integral here, right? It's captured by the integral over the zero modes. So the chi integral is the integral through this contour that goes downwards. And that um, integral over the L equal to zero mode is already done when you do this, uh, uh, the zero mode integral. And okay, that takes care of the L equal to zero mode. So L equal to zero mode, uh, is included in the analysis above, like the, the gamma function type analysis. Okay, so that's what I've shown here. Uh, the contour is passing through the saddle points vertically, so you need to uh, integrate vertically. And here is e to the plus something because the eigenvalue was negative, but we are integrating in an imaginary direction. So we get some well-defined value for this. Okay, uh, what about the L equals one modes? So this should be L equals one. L equals one has lambda equals LL plus one minus two equals zero. These are the promised Goldstone modes. There are three of them, M equals minus one, zero and one. And these are the three modes that correspond to the spontaneously broken PSL2C symmetry. And that's why you need that mass to be minus two. It can't be any other value. So now we have some integral like d of some mode, let's call it like dy, e to the zero times y squared. This is obviously infinite. So that's what happens. So one can just either keep this infinity around and later cancel it with the infinity of the gate group, or just say that uh, we will work with just one saddle point and no longer divide by the gauge group. Just like Fadiv Popov way of thinking about it. Anyway, so this is what it means. So if chi i denote these three modes, uh, chi, chi one minus one, chi one zero, chi one one, these we can just gauge fix to be just one particular value. We don't need to integrate over chi these three modes. Okay, so then the rest, for the L bigger than or equal to two, it's easy. There's just some Gaussian integral then. So for example, there will be an integral like d chi two comma zero e to the negative uh, 
2 times 3 minus 2 times chi squared, 2 comma 0. It's just some Gaussian. Gaussians give us square root of pi over the square root of the eigenvalue, or 12 plus 1 at each L. And so now we have some infinite product. And there are standard tricks to compute these infinite products um, that involves the so-called zeta function regularization, or you can put in explicit convergence factors, e to the minus epsilon squared lambda to damp out the uh, high frequency modes. So anyway, this part of the computation is relatively standard. And uh, for example, you need to do such sums. You turn an infinite product into an infinite sum and uh, use expressions like these. So there's some divergent piece Epsilon, you should think of it as some kind of UV cutoff on the field theory. There's log terms and constant terms. And anyway, it's, it's just a well-defined machine that you can run. So again, I don't want to go over the analogous computation on the hemisphere. It's the same. You have some zero modes, you have some negative mode, so on and so forth. All right, so how am I doing on time? I think we are close to uh, close to being done, right? Uh, yeah. How many more minutes do you need? I think uh, uh, maybe I, I can wrap up in five minutes. If, sounds good. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now just let me complete the circle and explain to you how the how this infinity in the numerator corresponds precisely to the infinity in the denominator. So these three in the numerator were the chi's that had zero eigenvalue. And then PSL2C has six coordinates. We separate them into SU2 and these Bs. So question is, when I take a phi configuration and act on it uh, with a PSL2C element that contains one of these B guys, how does the field change? That would be like a chi, right? And so here's the sphere, the background metric with the hat and sigma was just some constant on the sphere. But remember, I told you that uh, sigma is not a scalar. So if you have a constant and you do some diffio, you know, you don't get back the same constant. You have to work out what the, what the transformation is of the sigma field. Uh, here I have written uh, the six conformal killing vectors on the sphere. So they are just, just some vector fields. You can see they're holomorphic and their anti-holomorphic counterparts. So for example, this one just corresponds to rotation of the Z. So it corresponds to just a rotation about the north south axis. This one corresponds to a boost. It's like takes the south pole and sort of moves things towards the north pole. So these S's are the SU2 generators. They are the isometries and the rest are the honest to God conformal killing vectors. Anyway, uh, there is some metric on these on these functions that in, inherits from the C goes to zero modes. It's not important. The point I want to get at is how does the sigma transform? So if we make a diffeomorphism, Z going to Z tilde, it's the full metric that we should equate. And from this, you can work out how sigma tilde relates to sigma. You see that it depends, for example, on the derivatives of this reparameterization, it depends on z tilde prime as a function of z. And when you do that, you see that there are these three zeros. So that's like the s is not changing sigma at all. So that says that each constant sigma preserves those three symmetries. And these ones actually change. So there, this was the b1, b2, b3 they change sigma by some specific function of Z. And if you've looked at spherical harmonics in conformal coordinates, these are precisely the three uh, spherical harmonics at L equals one. This is like the X, this is like the Y, this is like the one minus Z squared, the one that has the cosine theta in it. So that's it. So, so we have our group, we act on it, uh, on the full metric, we infer a transformation for sigma, and that's how we relate uh, the chi's to the b's, right? So that, that's the point here, that even when we do this, there is this ratio that's still remaining. It's d chi over db. We need to know what, because we want to match precise numbers, we want to know what that number is, and this is how you compute it. Uh, 
anyway, I didn't get to the matrix integral part at all, but I think that's a more straightforward story. Like it's well known what the sphere and the disk correspond to in the matrix and um, people who are interested can read the paper for more details. But uh, let me end by showing you the final answer. So here is just uh, the sphere and the disk, just the Liouville part. These are just the Liouville parts. And uh, these are some answers. So this is the on-shell action. This is the one loop determinant. All these funky numbers come from that L bigger than or equal to two thing. And there are these leftover factors coming from this D chi over DB business. And this is exactly analogous structure for the, for the disk. You can form the ratio. You can add the minimal model part back because you see there was a minimal model that was there. This is the answer or the final answer, including the Liouville, ghost, matter, everything. So it's P alpha to the P plus two. Uh, alpha, as I said, was related to mu B. And you do the matrix integral answer, you find this exact in P answer. So if you take the large P limit, you just get this piece, which was the same as what I showed you. So this is this is a matrix, matrix side. Anyway, uh, let me stop there and thank you all for the attention. Thank you so much, Raghu, for the talk, for the great talk. Uh, are there any questions? So I, I do have a question. This, uh, the matrix answer that you just uh, showed at the end, so this is exact for any P, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I think at the beginning of your talk, you started by saying that uh, some of these, these this calculation, in part at least, it could be done for arbitrary P, yeah. right? So am I understanding this correctly, that you took the large P limit to have a more physical interpretation of the calculation? Yeah, you like if this you for, don't like, take large P, if you don't take large P, then the two loop and the three loop things on the Liouville side will be important. But you could do that calculation exactly, right? Well, not in terms of doing the integrals. We, we could do it exactly using some bootstrap formulas. Like, so the Liouville theory has been solved by bootstrap. Like there is this DOZZ formula for the yeah, three point functions. So you're saying it's, it's not direct. It's not like you can't yeah. interpret things term by term, I see. So the exact that, yeah. formulas go through these papers by the Zamologikovs that solve the boundary bootstrap and the and you know the bulk bootstrap for Liouville. But when when Zamologikov was doing this and back in the days, they did not cross check this calculation, right? Yeah, uh, yeah no, they did not. So there is a paper by uh, Zam, by I think a. Uh, one, one single author paper by Zamologikov that uh, called, it's called On the Entropy of Random Surfaces in which he was computing the sphere diagram using these semi-classical techniques. But that was way before the duality was known. So he had this idea of the saddle points that the, each saddle point breaks the conformal symmetry. That idea was there in that paper which was the main idea that we used. Okay, we dot, we put in some exact numbers, but. I see. So I think the timeline is that the entropy on random surfaces paper is like 1982 or something. It's very soon after Polyakov's paper on the quantum geometry of the bosonic string, which is wow. early eighties. But this matrix duality came out like in the late eighties. So. I don't think anyone had made this precise match, at least in their papers that claim and we cite some papers, but uh, yeah, anyway, there was okay. there was room for this paper to be written. So we kind of, I see. But yeah, I want to say that almost uh, none of the ideas individually were like novel. We just had to put all the pieces very painfully together with all the factors of two and minus signs and thinking about the saddle points and contours and so on. So that's what made this project hard. Like all, yeah. Well, was there was there some sort of like, a, uh, I guess, because I'm not,
quite familiar with the history of these, these calculations. Was there some sort of a confusing point or paradox of some type that motivated the, uh, the, the matching? Yeah, like I think the confusing yes. thing is, for example, the free energy for the matrix. So on the matrix side, uh, you know, people computed. So this, this answer is a function of mu. So let's take the two comma three model. You can compute the fact that it goes like mu to the five halves in this model. So this five halves is very robust and people computed it a million dif different ways. The most famous is being the so-called KPZ scaling. But there's a prefactor here, which no one seemed to worry about. I see. And essentially what we did was computed this prefactor. I see. Thank you. And uh, you compare that free factor is why you need to divide by the disk because the disk, you know, would go like mu to the five quarters. So then the mu's will cancel in the ratio. Right, right, right. And there's no way to sort of map this mu absolutely to the mu of the Liouville. Like, you know that it scales with the power one, but the mu of the Liouville could have been 25 times the mu of the matrix. So, you know, you don't know how to translate this power law unless you've computed this number and this number precisely. Right, right. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Raghu again uh, for the wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll, if you don't mind, we're going to put the video on YouTube. Yeah, that's, that's good for me. Thanks, Nima. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks so much. All right. Okay, Take bye. care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.